I think we have to be sensitive that we're not the audience that we are trying to serve um, in technology. We think it's very easy. I'm Adam Bolka, and this is the Great Supply Chain Podcast. I'll be talking to supply chain experts from around the world, experts who are tackling challenges in their corner of the industry. People are changemakers that drive innovation. That's why this supply chain podcast is about learning from those who lead by example. I hope that the conversations you hear will inspire you to drive change within your organization. Let's jump in. Welcome back to the Great Supply Chain Podcast. So most of us are starting to see the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. But it's been a long and dark one for many companies involved in logistics. To help unpack some of the dynamics at play, we have a great guest for you today in Matt Gunn. Together with Guy Courtain on the menu is the state of logistics, some lessons learned, and what the path ahead looks like for logistics providers. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Guy, who will welcome our guest, Matt. Thanks, Adam, for the intro, and we're here with Matt Gunn. Matt? Guy, Adam, thanks for having me here. This is awesome. We're looking forward to this. For those of you guys who, who don't know and you should know, Matt and I uh, were, well, Matt was the star of our uh, supply chain podcast back when we were the Infor days, uh, which still lives, uh, not in infamy, but still lives out there, which, you know, I think is pretty cool. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, a session today uh, with Mr. Matt Gunn. So Matt, first and foremost, intro on who you are and turn over to you. Who is Matt Gunn? Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, I won't get too existential here, but I'm just another marketer trying to make his way in the universe. But um, I've been in the logistics and supply chain space for about a decade here, coming up through GT Nexus um, and um, seeing that through to Infor, where I expanded from uh, motion booking and visibility onto warehouse management and execution and planning. Um, also went to Llamasoft. So um up until recently was with the more mature startups right as they exit and, and, and have been through a couple of rodeos in that space. And it's, um, it's been fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's been uh, thoroughly fun watching your, your progression through the industry. Yeah. Um, a lot of work has been in streamlining and digitizing those manual and just labor intensive processes um, that, that are still so prevalent in our industry. Uh, we all work in email. We all work in spreadsheets. I feel like in some ways I've been competing against those two things my whole life. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. So, you know, I think it's it's really interesting from our perspective and, and the things that we look at today when you're looking at things that are happening in Asia when it comes to transportation, logistics, and fulfillment. Obviously, you mentioned the pandemic. I, I don't want to say we're out of it. We're obviously, hopefully, at the tail end of it. Um, but when you look at the pandemic as, as a whole, Right. What have you seen in the market for the past two years, specifically around what's happening when you, as you said, like in region, transportation, fulfillment, logistics? I think where we sit today, we're starting to feel things start to return to normal. I know I made a Twitter comment earlier about how I finally regained my, my, my airline status, right? And it's been a few years since I've been able to re-ramp that up um, um, from not traveling. And um we're starting to feel it here, but um, on the other side, it's still very prevalent. When you have China with a zero COVID policy and when you have an outbreak at, say, um, a terminal, uh, it can stop operations. And so we still feel that bullwhip effect and will continue to for much of the rest of this year um, as we, we try to get back to that normal from a global logistics um, and shipping perspective. Um, I think as far as, as some of the signs um, that it's normalizing, you know, um, it's a lot of hurry up and wait, but um, container prices came down from their peak, um, but they're still over $10,000 a container um, and service levels are still not quite there. So we've got some work to do. So do you think, I mean, obviously the, the, the main headlines we all see are, oh, there's 105 ships sitting on a Long Beach, right? Um, I'm not getting my Teddy Ruxpin doll in the mail. Um, there are not enough, you know, chips coming in for automobiles and other parts and you talked about the rest of this year i mean do you do you see this clearing up before the end of the year do you see this as a long term and and a second question of that is will this change the way we look at at fulfillment logistics transportation sourcing all the things that we looked at in supply chain is this going to be a wake-up call or are we just going to go you know sort of flush this out and then go back to our old habits it's easy to get comfortable 
I think, and, and, and move on to the next thing. I think we do have to continue to, to drive for change here. I mean, I go out to the grocery store, and uh, for the first time in three months, I was able to find a box of Rice Krispies. I mean, like, even stuff that isn't, like, imported, it's still, it's very uneven how we're getting things back, and we'll still see a lot of that unevenness. Um, and and I think we just have to, to buckle up and, and not focus on um, a ship that's stuck outside of a port, but really go deeper into the issue. If you can see a ship and it's unable to be unloaded at a terminal at destination, that gets you nowhere. And so um, we really have to kind of think deeper and, and dive into some of the, the forensics that are happening at Origin as well. So you talked a lot about sort of at Origin and at destination. Uh, and honestly, at Origin, you know what, China still produces 30% of products in the world today. So regardless of what we say about nearshoring and all this, we're still sort of stuck with China as our manufacturing powerhouse. Do you foresee any changes with their policies with regards to COVID and the pandemic? Are there pressures being put on it from external forces, aka US government, EU, things like that? But from your perspective, like, how, will things change in the near term? Or do we need to learn to live with this type of you know, stringent policies that we're seeing in the Far East? I think we have to learn how to navigate all of it and and continue with it. I think if the recent um, Winter Olympics are any indication, um, we're not there yet as far as everyone universally feeling that it's safe and comfortable and that that we can manage um, these outbreaks and these issues that they happen and and culturally that that change management takes time. I think even before the pandemic, things people were thinking, oh my gosh, am I going to have to reshape my logistics network because. The two years leading up to it, we were into in a, in a trade war, right? We had massive tariffs that were coming up, and people were rethinking their networks. Did it really change things? Not entirely. Maybe you could move a couple factories to, to Thailand or, or Vietnam or other places in region, but generally speaking, um, all of the tooling and all of the factories that are able to support it are still somewhere else. Uh, so if we are going to bring things closer or nearer, um, that's going to take several years to really truly ramp up and and again we start getting comfortable in things once they feel normal-ish and, and it's human nature to say look it's back working again this is okay without necessarily diagnosing the problem um, that exists do you think or are you seeing with your customers or are they because and maybe this is a leading question so some of the customers i've spoken to um, in healthcare and other spaces are are actually opening up starting to talk about we need to rethink lean. We need to rethink just in time. We need to rethink our position in inventory, which I think has a trickle down effect to, hey, how much more stuff do I order? You know, how much do I hold near shore? Maybe it's not manufacturing, but do I hold it, you know, more inventory uh, in my markets? Are you seeing any of these types of, because you said, right, the fundamental need issues have to be looked at. Are you seeing any of your customers openly starting to talk to you guys about this? Or do you think this is still just, like you said, hey, let's just try to get through this and we'll go back to our old ways. You know, I think I've heard a lot of the same things, but we still largely serve an audience that is focused on transportation, global logistics, and, you know, maybe don't even own the products that they're moving. Um, you know, we started with the logistics service providers, and, and in their world, um, you know, they've either gone from having too much supply and it's been easy or now absolutely no supply and all the demand. Um, so they're balancing a couple of different things. So I'm sure they would encourage people to rethink inventory strategies, but it's, it takes time to ramp that up as well to, you know, get the um, warehousing space, um, you know, domestically or in, in you know, the, the local markets so that you can um, bolster your network for a little bit of uh, uh, more resiliency. Do you think it's up to those folks, the, the shippers, the logistics providers, to maybe take some more leadership and to push, to your point, right, push the manufacturers, the brands, the retailers, the pharmaceutical, the healthcare companies, right, all the people that are using their services to move products, do you think that the logistics players need to, to in a way, sort of step up and be leaders in innovation with this? Is this an opportunity for them to, to, to show that? I think there is. I think that... Um... You know, once they, they can stop being sort of a punching bag for, you know, those that are feeling the pain of congestion at a port, um, it, it is in them their best interest to really partner with their customers, the shippers, the vendors, the factories, even to an extent, the ocean liner companies. Um, 
and and help champion that. Ultimately, if you are in logistics, your job is so focused on just customer service. You're just trying to keep everyone happy and and work your relationships so you can maintain um, the service levels that you have, the edge that you have in in those um, shipping lanes and, and with those carriers. And then on your customer side, you want to give them the best high touch service and data that um, that is possible, and really give them a sense that you are the expert and that you can help control their destiny with moving freight around the world. Um, and and so they are challenged. Um, they're going to have to do a little bit of show and not just tell. You can't say you're going to fix it, but you do have to show some real improvement there. You mentioned something, which let's let's pull that thread a bit, data, right? So sharing data, the, the shippers, 3PLs, right? They're amassing a tremendous amount of data. And not only do they have data for each of their customers, but they have the aggregate data across all their customers, are, are you seeing or what are you seeing today in terms of the strategy around how do they monetize, leverage, use the data? Is it just they collect it and give it to their customers or are they are there value add services they're providing uh, to their customers? The best ones are able to use data better. And we do see some evidence and and certainly I have some evidence and customers where now they're helping facilitate the conversation about just how well they're performing from origin to destination, that they can show that the shippers, carriers, um, the you know the Maersks of the world and the One Networks and you know some of the bigger ocean liners there, are performing against contract levels. It's an interesting thing when you're you're an LSP, and and I'll focus on that just because so much of the pain and so much of the challenge for our customers is really in that that area, either managing an LSP or being the LSP and managing their customers' expectations, that everything around moving freight still depends on on people. And, and it's almost um, intentionally kept complicated um, and um, hard to really truly digitize and leverage the data. So you never really have a picture of how things are performing. You always have a lot of lagging indicators, but you can't really see what's happening right now or, or understand what is coming, going to happen or even see patterns that exist that uh, might be um, hidden to the human eye. So that's interesting. So you, you mentioned it's still people, right, that are moving stuff. Um, so when it comes to that, are you what are you guys seeing from that perspective? I mean, obviously, we all hear, right, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, like all these – it's always about, well, there's a labor shortage, right? There's there's the great, uh, what is it, great resignation where everybody from blue collar to white collar are, are leaving their jobs. But we see it in particular, right, in the fulfillment side, right? Not enough warehouse labor. Obviously, you and I have seen this now for years, right? The, the upcoming truck driver shortage that's happening. Um, how are you seeing that today? And, and, and are you seeing anybody approach it with some innovative thinking? Yeah, labor issues aren't just... Um something that we experience in North America either. Um, if you think about it, where your operators are located, they're often stationed at the terminal or near the terminal, which they are servicing. They're, they're um, very close to both the um, suppliers of finished goods and freight, as well as the suppliers of, of space, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the shipping lines. And so, those offices and those people are feeling the same pain. There's a lot of pressure on them right now. And um, there's also a lot of opportunity to go somewhere else. And and so it's it's in a competitive market, that's also a natural thing. Or you say, I give up. Or this is just too hard and, and there's no real reward for it. Um, and so it's it's something that we're acutely aware of because we know that as much technology and automation and and um, other services can can exist that can improve parts of this. There's always going to be humans involved every step along the way, um, whether you're the one at the end consuming it and purchasing it, or whether you're the one working in the warehouse trying to fulfill it, or whether you're even farther upstream and you're you're trying to ensure that that freight just gets out of your terminal and you can move on to the next thing. Um, you know, people have to um, be involved. We want to make them involved in the right things and give them a sense that um, it's not all about this re-entering data or just really remedial stuff that happens. If you think about it, when an email comes in, 
it doesn't necessarily go into a TMS system. You have someone sitting there on a keyboard reading the email, taking little bits of information or finding a PDF or a spreadsheet and then moving that data from one little system to the next and the next to the next. And, you know, you wonder why people don't want to do that job for long, especially when the volume goes up and, and demand is high. So it can be a very frustrating practice. Um, but we do have to support our people and, and be able to give them a path where they're better able to spend time with the customer, to service them, to um, take some of that pain off and feel like they're actually being productive. Right. So that leads to another question. I know you and I have had this debate for a bazillion years, right? But when we talk about technology, right, we're talking about the people. I think it's absolutely necessary and that, that's a huge component. But you mentioned your example is fantastic, right? It's like I get information out of an email and now I have to put in my TMS system or WMS or my OMS or my ERP uh, and that takes time. That's tedious. But then the technology side of it is is and you and I sit in these chairs sometimes and we might be guilty of this. But as a technology provider, oftentimes we seem to promise a lot, but not deliver it. What, where where do you see we the technology providers out there? What is our responsibility today to help with the people and the businesses uh, for tomorrow? Yeah, look, I mean, I think we're past the point where as a technology provider, you can just make a boxed piece of software and, you know, help implement it and walk away. And that seems to be a lot of what happens in our industry, right? They, they have an execution system, a planning system, um, you generate a big install base and, and you get the business and, and maybe you have some customer support or some, some areas where someone can call if things go wrong, but ultimately, um, you don't really talk to them until two or three years down the line when is the next renewal cycle or when you have a new product that you want to upsell. Um, I think we have to be sensitive that we're not the audience that we are trying to serve um, in technology. We think it's very easy. We're creating these magical solutions that, you know, from our own lens in our in our technology ivory towers here or maybe in an attic in pittsburgh where i'm sitting right now at least um we think that it's great and, and so yeah it's the same as as enabling people to do their jobs better or more seamlessly or, or take some of the pain out um you know we have to to realize that it is um humans that we have to to help with through our technology and and we should be there as a partner every step along the way right so it is really much more collaborative than just sort of, you know, program it, sell it, leave it, move on, right? And I think that's, it's a tool at the end of the day, right? It's a tool that we, creators of that tool, help the users of that tool know how to best use it, but be there with them, as you said, to to understand, you know, what it can do and what it can't do. Yeah, and it's just one tool of many, right? Um, you know, as I was kind of joking earlier on, but it is quite true. I mean, you're not ever going to truly eliminate uh, Excel or, or an email. Those are ways that people document information and and plan and and collaborate with each other. So do you really want to disrupt and interrupt that? Not necessarily. You want to bring technology into the context of which people are working. Don't make it hard. Right. Well, I, I thought Slack was going to replace all email. <laughs> Uh, how did we schedule our podcast? <laughs> uh, yeah, through email. You're right. Some text messages, a couple email, emails. Yeah. I, I, don't get me, don't get me started on Slack because I, I'm old enough to remember Yahoo I am when it was basically the same thing, but it just called Yahoo I am. But anyway. Uh, you know, yeah. I didn't even open your email document until two minutes before we hopped on to the recording <laughs> session. I apologize, you know, but uh, it makes our conversations more fun. Too. More fresh. It's more fresh, right? <laughs> All right, Matt, this is great. So one more question from your perspective, as you sit in your ivory tower in your attic in Pittsburgh, right, overlooking, hopefully getting a Permanti sandwich later on this weekend, for me at least, because I haven't had one in a long time. Um, when you look out, you know, from your perspective, where what are you excited about as we progress in the 2022 and beyond in terms of innovation? Um, you know, whether it's in fulfillment logistics or supply chain in general, I mean, what what excites you um, every day when you look out there? Um, I'm excited for the opportunity to do things a little bit differently. And I know they say that through a very personal lens. Uh, but as normal has started to return and as I've started to you know, attend events and conferences and, and, and see the market again for the first time in, in a couple of years, more than two years, um, I do worry a little bit because a lot of it hasn't changed. Um, I go out into the the you know, an industry trade show and it's, it's all the same words being used as were used three years ago. And it's the same booths and the same people. And I think 
personally, my own attention span and my own focus has changed a lot through, through this. And I do hope that we can continue to push forward to do things a little bit differently or not forget the things that got us to where we are right now. Again, it, it'll be easy to forget this pandemic when we can all go outside without masks and, and not worry about, you know, infecting someone else or, or worry about, you know, my car being delivered or at a lot when I want to purchase it or all those crazy things that we think about my rice krispies like you know and once we stop worrying about those things or seeing it very visually seeing an empty store shelf or you know an empty car lot or um or things like that it's gonna feel okay and comfortable and normal we can't let go of the pain that we've been through if we want to keep moving this thing forward yeah no well said well said so Matt this has been fantastic so for our audience how can people get in touch with you uh, what's the best way to, to contact the Matt Gun? <laughs> well, it's only the Matt Gun on, on Instagram, and it's just all pictures of kids and tall buildings and stuff. But if you do want to reach out to me or or learn a little bit more about what I'm doing these days, um, find me on Twitter at Matt Gun, M A T T G U N N, or or just shoot me an email. I think it's publicly available. I won't say it here, but you know, I know the podcast people, and they're always chasing me down. They're always chasing you down. So again, Matt, this has been awesome. As you per usual, time flies. Love these conversations. Hopefully uh, we'll be able to test our new podcasting equipment live when we're back out in the road again. And, and now that you have status again, you'll be flying around the world uh, in your business class seat, I'm sure. So maybe I'll see you, you know, maybe you'll let me into the, the lounge when, when I see you in the airport. Hey, I still fly coach, but now I can get an easier upgrade, I guess. So whatever. <laughs> So with that, Matt, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for listening and looking forward to our next one. All right. Thanks, Guy. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this conversation, your advice, your heated warnings. Until next time, this has been the Great Supply Chain Podcast. Well, that's it for this episode, folks. I hope our guests sparked some new ideas and inspired you to push the boundaries of supply chain. New podcasts will be published on the first of every month. In the meantime, please reach out with your thoughts or questions or even an idea for a future episode. You can email us at texaspodcast at texas.com. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get notified as soon as a new episode goes live. And please share it with a colleague and leave a review. Until then, this has been the Great Supply Chain Podcast. I'm Adam Polka, and thank you for tuning in.